I want to uh, thank Roddy Yates for many years of, I think, really inspired leadership. Uh, this is, these conferences uh, in Europe have been uh, very refreshing for, for us. I really enjoy uh, being here, and I uh, want to congratulate Faden for uh, the next phase of the EFTC adventure. <clears throat> I, I, I have to, uh, while, while we're waiting for a minute, when I was in Bangkok last year, I had a t-shirt which said in seven languages, I'm sorry for our president. <clears throat> Naya forbid me to wear it today, but I do want to apologize. Coming to, uh, to Europe and speaking about climate change to, uh, to you from a country where the president, other th in addition to being one of the most distasteful people in the planet, is also a, a real sociopath in terms of climate change. Uh, I, th I think uh, at this point, uh, I, I didn't come here to lecture you about climate change. Climate change is real. Climate change is happening. Uh, it's not uh, something that's going to happen. It's something that's happening and accelerating very rapidly in our world. And there are consequences for all of us uh, in, the, uh, in the TC world. George de Leon, who we, as uh, uh, Rowdy called him, the, possibly the Pope, but I think probably the more appropriate term would be the rabbi of, uh, of therapeutic communities, <laughs> uh, has used the term in, in all of his uh, talks about right living. And uh, right living uh, is really something that's pretty unusual. It's one of the things that really defines therapeutic communities rather than more clinical approaches because it really has a moral component. It means we really take on the responsibility of, uh, of, a, of, of the moral education of our residents and students. Uh, so that they, and, and that's a, a very important part of the education that a teaching and therapeutic community provides. So in the face of the, really the greatest crisis that humanity has faced, really since uh, uh, we came out of the, the forests and the jungles, uh, climate change, what is right living? What should we do? What can we do and what must we do uh, as members of, of therapeutic communities in terms of right living and in terms of being responsible? And I think, as Naya said earlier, therapeutic communities have always responded to the crisis of the time, whether it was heroin addiction or crack addiction, in many cases, uh, uh, kids who were co-opted into military adventures, uh, you know, prostitution, homelessness. In every case, uh, therapeutic communities have responded to these crises with very innovative approaches. So we've got to look at, at the, uh, uh, rather than being climate nihilist, which is it's just too big, we can't do anything about it, uh, uh, we have to look at what's our moral responsibility to face this huge crisis. Uh, and I'm suggesting three very, very practical steps. Uh, one, education. Second, safeguarding the campuses and facilities where our, where our students live. And thirdly, connection and action. Every uh, student, every resident, every faculty member, every employee must be educated about climate change. We cannot be indifferent to what's going on. What causes it? Where are we today? Where are we heading? And what are the things that we can do? What are the things we can do individually? Because in therapeutic communities, we're not preparing people to live in the therapeutic community. We're preparing them to live in the larger society, responsibly. That's what right living is all about. So what can they do individually? 
well, while they're in the TC, but when they leave the TC, what are the things that they can do that make a difference? What are the things we can do in our TC communities? And thirdly, what are the things we can do in the larger communities that we live in, in the, the villages, the cities, the states, the, the nations? So that's the first point, education. It's a responsibility. Scientists have told us for years they were right. And there are a lot of people who still have their heads in that sand. And we do have a choice. We do have a choice. This is not something that we just have to blindly accept. At this point, there is so much information about climate change, uh, both on a, a, an intellectual level, on a very practical level. It's there, and there's lots of organizations. I get probably three or four emails every day in my inbox with information about what's going on in the world. Uh, the information is uh, easily available now, uh, and we need to take advantage of it. We need to make it available for, for our students and faculty. So what do we expect? Let's get real. What do we expect? Extreme weather, heat, we know that, global warming, but cold, rain. In Houston, a couple of years ago, they got 50 inches of rain. Think, 50 inches of rain in 24 hours. So we, get, we don't get just rain, we get rain bombs, which will flood even desert climates. We get drought, of course, and of course, flooding. Fires, and we've seen them as you watch your television. You see them all over the world. You see fires in Greenland, fires in Siberia, as well as in drier climates, California, Australia. Food shortages. As the climates warm up, you can't grow all the crops. The crops begin to wither and die. Uh, certain plants won't grow. If, uh, in, in, uh, so we'll begin to have, we can expect, there will be problems with, with crop failures and food distribution. Power interruptions, both from tremendous drains on a power system that wasn't designed for it, and fires and floods and other hurricanes, of course, will knock out uh, electrical facilities. Air and water pollution, we're always already seeing a lot of that. Uh, in the United States, 30,000 people a year die from air pollution. And some places, of course, it's much worse. Increased disease, because some, many of the uh, diseases that are tropical diseases are gonna start moving into the United States, into Europe, into northern climates. Social, financial, and political volatility. We can expect in 10 years perhaps a billion climate refugees. Think of the chaos in Europe and in the United States, but particularly in Europe with a few hundred thousand refugees, many of which are really climate refugees. Uh, so not enough resources to rebuild after storms. You have these repeated events and you, know, you, you can't rebuild every time and an exacerbation of inequality. So these are all, you know, things that we just have to be realistic about expecting. Well, what can we do in our therapeutic communities in terms of safeguarding? Solar power, generators, or battery storage, and being very conservative. Water shortages, we should be rain harvesting and doing water conservation and having the ability to store fairly large amounts of water uh, for our residents, you know, in these times when there are shortages. Emergency food storage. And of course, we should all have gardens. We should be gardening so that we can produce healthy organic food. Cooling and heating systems, we need both for these extremes in temperature. Flood preparation, diet change, you're reading all these things from the UN now. Finally, they're saying a plant-based diet is one of the ways we can save the planet. It's much more efficient. And it's much, we build a stronger immune system so that we are more resistant to some of the uh, traumas that, that climate change will bring to us. 
preparation for increased disease, preparation for fire risk, filtration for air and water, because we're going to have real problems there, hybrid or electric vehicles, and using a lot of public transportation so that we're, our carbon footprint is less, and train the faculty and the students for all these eventualities. It has to be just part of what we do. The third is connection and action. Okay, we can't be passive in the face of this, and we can't be siloed in the face of this. We've got to do whatever we can. When we get involved with local organizations, there's two aspects of it. One is we bring additional resources into the therapeutic community, things that, that are in the community that could be resources for us in times of crisis, but also we share resources that we have with the community, and we strengthen our, link, our links with the local community so that we are both a receiver and we are also a contributor to our communities dealing with these problems. Getting involved with national and international organizations, they're there. You know, we uh, just uh, took 12 of our uh, Amity faculty and our top management to Al Gore's climate reality class to become climate reality leaders because we think that's a responsibility for us to both lead within our organization and without. And vote. <laughs> we do have that opportunity in our democratic countries to make our voice heard. And we have a responsibility to vote for people who are interested in and willing to take action on this, this climate crisis. We shouldn't call it a climate issue. It really is a crisis, and we have to react in that way. And the other thing, and this is where I think TCs have enormous power that we unused, untapped power. With your purchases, every, uh, 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 this guy we've worked with, Ellis Jones, has made the point, we only get to vote maybe every two years or every four years, but every day we vote when we purchase. When we purchase from a climate criminal company, that is destroying the planet for profit, okay, with disregard for the health of the planet and the health of us as human beings living on it, we're voting for them to continue that rapacious behavior. When we, when we refuse to vote for them with our dollar and we vote for a socially responsible organization that is trying to deal with the climate crisis in a responsible way, we are making a significant difference. Well, think, all of us in therapeutic communities, we're buying stuff every day, aren't we? You bet we are. We're buying lots of stuff around the world. And I think we have a voice that we're not using. Here's some organizations. This is one here in Europe, which is very vital. Uh, these are just, you know, one of the hundreds or a few of the hundreds of organizations who are involved in this around the world. So we have to go from just recovery to activism. We have to become activists in the face of this crisis. And we can vote, we can elect leaders who will take action, and we can, as I was saying, vote with our purchases. Every purchase can reward a good company and punish a bad one. So these are different things. The Better World Shopper, there's a European equivalent, the Ethical Company Organization, the B Lab. All these organizations essentially assess organizations in terms of social justice, in terms of their climate, uh, what they're doing in terms of the climate and the environment, how they treat their employees. And these resources are available to us and there's even online ones. You can put it on your phone. So when you go shopping, there it is. You can pick a responsible organization. So right living is getting out of denial. If you're a drug addict, you have to realize, no, you're not just ruining your life. You're 
really having a negative effect on a lot of other lives. That's the first step in terms of recovery. Recognize the effect you have on other people, uh, 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 your behavior on other people. And then getting involved in doing something larger than yourself. Sounds like therapeutic community. And developing a new narrative, as George said, a new lifestyle, a new identity. And that means a new narrative about who you are and how you behave in the world. So dealing with the climate crisis is right living in today's TC. So what can we do? Well, we've already done some of it. So, uh, today at EFTC, uh, EFTC has agreed to adopt uh, a memorandum for all of its members to address the climate crisis and to use these three steps of education, safeguarding, and action. Okay? So we're going to get every TC in Greece to sign up. Wow, think about how many votes that is. Can we get all the TCs in EFTC? Can we get all the TCs in the world? If we could get all the TCs in the world to sign up to really address the climate crisis in this way, we will be making both a statement about who we are in today's world, and we're making a statement about how we can come together and make a difference. So tomorrow, you know, is the beginning of a seven-day strike, climate strike. I'm not expecting you all to leave tomorrow to support that. <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> but I do hope that all of us in all of our therapeutic communities will encourage our leadership, our students, our faculty, our administrators, all the people that we have contact with, families. We have a lot of influence to step up and join this fight, to fight for the planet, which is the only one we've got, and to ameliorate. We can't change some of the things that are going to happen, but we can definitely ameliorate the causes of climate change if we act together. And when we act together, just as when people said once an addict, uh, always an addict, and there was this hopeless kind of nihilism about drug abuse, and therapeutic communities, people came along with the problem and said, hell no, we can do something, and started something that we are still a part of 60 years later, help, having helped millions of people around the planet. We can play that same role with the climate crisis. We can be leaders. We can be people who make a difference because we are <laughs> we are loud, we are aggressive, and we just don't believe that something that people say can't be done, can't be done. So let's join Greta and all the young people who we have a responsibility because they're going to have to live this planet during, as this crisis deepens. Let's help them stop the worst effects of it and let's give them a planet that they can live on and thrive on. Thank you.